Hello, hello, wonderful to have you here. What I want to talk about in today's video is this strange word, Tathagata. It's the word that the Buddha often used to refer to himself in the third person in the early suttas, and it was also a, a word that was used to, to, to refer to the Buddha himself by other people. Uh, but what does it mean, and where does it come from? Uh, this is a question that I think has uh, confused many of us, and many of us have wondered about it, because it's a strange word. It, after all, isn't the word Buddha, which is what we often use to refer to the Buddha. Uh, so why is it separate? What does it mean? Over the years, it's taken on an almost limitless number of different meanings and nuances, and I'm not going to obviously be able to go into all of those in today's video. There's uh, an innumerable amount of them. Uh, if you have some that you want to discuss or are interested in that I haven't mentioned, please go ahead and leave them down in the, in the notes below. Uh, what I'm going to do today instead is to focus on a few of the, of the most important ones and some of the salient parts of the history here. Uh, it's a word that is used to refer within Buddhism to the Buddha himself, as I say, and it's a word that is almost taken to be expressive only of him that it's sort of a word that is uh, so unique that it is for him alone, almost as though no other particular word would do. And I'm going to get uh, back to this aspect of the word Tathagata at the end of the video. So, okay, for, th for the video what I want to do, first of all, I'm going to look at a couple of the most important sort of standard interpretations of the term, and then I'm going to turn to a couple of issues with the history of the term that I think illuminate its meaning and usage, and that aren't as widely known. So to begin with, some proposed meanings of the term. Uh, the great 5th century uh, scholar, monk, Buddhaghosa, had uh, eight different interpretations of the term Tathagata, which were based on supposed etymologies of the term, that is, sort of histories of what the word meant in the past, or at least of the parts of the word. Uh, for modern scholars, however, this, these uh, interpretations, this, these etymologies are thought of as, or seen as being either fanciful or sort of creative. They're not really etymologies that are taken particularly seriously nowadays. Uh, nevertheless, it's, it's important at least to point out that this exists within the tradition. Uh, nowadays, we see there are essentially two etymologies of the term uh, Tathagata that are seen as most important. Uh, the, the term itself is a compound of two different words. The problem with the compound is that it can be divided up in various different ways, and it's not, in, it's not immediately clear which of these ways is correct. The two standard ways of splitting up the term are as tata plus gata, or tata plus agata. Uh, the first, tata plus gata, means thus gone, or at least one, uh, one uh, translation of it would be thus gone. Tata plus agata would be thus come. So we have these two different potential meanings of the term tathagata, and neither of them, I, I would submit to you, neither of them is particularly useful on their face so they need interpretation. Now, that said, most scholars nowadays uh, consider the first of these uh, two interpretations to be the more correct, that is, thus gone. And in that regard, uh, this one Buddhist scholar, Andy Alensky, a wonderful scholar and a friend of mine actually, uh, wrote a, a paper back in the mid-90s where he looked at uh, one place in the early suttas where he finds a term tathagata. Actually, it's not a term used for the Buddha himself, but it's used in a different context. The same word in a different context. And so what he, did, what he does is to look at, at that word in that separate context and see what it means there. So we find in this sutta a passage that reads like this. In ancient times, when seafaring merchants put out to sea in ships, they took with them a bird to sight land. When the ship was out of sight of land, they released the bird, and it flew eastward and westward, northward and southward, 
upward and all around, and if the bird sighted land nearby, it was truly gone. But if the bird saw no land, it returned to the ship. Now the word translated here by Andy Alinsky as truly gone, uh, another translation has gone for good, uh, is that term tatagata. Uh, so we find there this term understood as thus gone, not thus come. That wouldn't make any sense in this context. Um, so what does it mean then? How does, how does Andy Alensky take this as useful uh, to the interpretation of the term? Well, Andy sees a couple of different ways that the term can be expressive of who the Buddha is. Uh, first of all, as we'll know in a traditional sense, any enlightened being, the Tathagata himself, the Buddha, is not going to be reborn after he dies because the enlightenment, one of the features of enlightenment is that it makes this into your last birth. You're not going to be reborn. And so to that extent, the Buddha is, after death, truly gone. He's gone for good. And although he's still alive when he was speaking the words he spoke, nevertheless he called himself a Tathagata because of, at least this is one interpretation, because he would be gone for good at his, la at his next death. Also, within this lifetime, the enlightened person, and this is the second interpretation that Andy gives, within this lifetime, the enlightened person is unattached to anything in the world. Uh, as Andy explains in his, his article, I'll leave a link to the article down below, by the way, in the notes, by the way. As Andy explains in his article, in the same way that the bird does not alight on any further things, at least nearby, that's the point, he's, he's truly gone, in the same way, the enlightened uh, person does not attach themselves to any objects of experience, indeed to anything at all. In this sense, they have left behind their attachments in the same way that the bird has left behind the, the boat that it was on, and that they're considered in many of these early texts to be what's said to be untraceable by Mara. Mara is this god of temptation. Uh, the god who tries to get us back into samsara, to keep us within this, uh, this manifest world of, of, of life and death, birth and death. And once one has attained enlightenment, one is outside of, of Mara's sight. One is not traceable, that Mara cannot find one because one's not attached. It's attachments that bring us into Mara's realm. So this is another way we could understand Tathagata as thus gone, that, it's, that the, the Buddha is gone from the uh, purview, the, the, the view, the, the uh, uh, place in which Mara can find him. Now the Pali scholar Richard Gombrich inter interprets the term Tathagata in a slightly different way. He notes that in compounds, sometimes the term gata loses its primary meaning of gone and instead takes on a meaning something more like just being or existing. So instead of the, the term tatagata meaning thus gone, it just means thus being or the, the being who is that way, the being who is like that. And Richard Gombrich takes this to be an expression of the Buddha that sort of goes beyond language. As he says, this is tantamount to saying that there are no words to describe his state. He can only point to it. By calling himself the Tathagata, uh, the Buddha might, at least on Richard Gombrich's interpretation, be saying that he's simply beyond description, that, that he is in a state that cannot be adequately put into words, so the only thing that he can call himself is the one who is like that. The, the person who is like that, and just, you know, point, basically, to himself as the one who is like this. At least that's one way to interpret it. So now that we've gotten something of an understanding of what the term might mean in its Buddhist context, uh, we should turn to a couple of historical aspects of the term that I think are often overlooked or not well understood nowadays. Uh, the first of these is that, at least within an early Buddhist context, the term Tathagata was taken to at least potentially refer to any enlightened being, not simply the Buddha. So in one early sutta we read, When a person's mind is freed like this, 
The gods, together with Indra, Brahma, and Pajapati, search as they may, will not find anything that such a Tathagata's consciousness depends on. Why is that? Because even in the present life, the Tathagata is undiscoverable, I say. So here we see in this sutta the Buddha describing basically any enlightened being as a Tathagata, that once you are enlightened, once you're out of the range of discoverability by the gods, and in particular by Mara, really, then you are a Tathagata. So the Buddha is, is basically saying that, it's, that the word Tathagata is not exclusive to him alone. Now, in later Buddhism, this seems to have changed somewhat, where the word Tathagata really only describes the, the Buddha himself. Uh, and indeed, it's one indication of the earliness of the particular sutta in which this passage I just read appears, that it discusses Tathagata in this way. Uh, because we can understand that as, as time went on, Tathagata became more and more an epithet of one's, one particular person, and less and less a description of a class of people, the, that is to say, enlightened beings. Indeed, this, this particular passage I read is, is from the Water Snake Sutta, one of the most famous of the early suttas uh, in Buddhism. However, having said that, we do have to be aware when we're, when we're reading uh, translations of this sutta that sometimes translators will actually not use the untranslated word tathagata in that particular uh, passage I just read. They'll translate it out. They'll say something like, uh, you know, the thus gone one or something like that. They're not, they'll, they'll essentially make the translation such that the word tathagata, the untranslated word tathagata, is only used for the Buddha, but in, in, in contexts like this, where the word seems to apply to a non-Buddha, that is to say, another arahant, they'll translate it a different way. And in that way, uh, this is one of the ways that um, the translations can sort of muddy the waters, and it helps to know the original, uh, the original language at least a little bit, so that we can see when translators are taking slight liberties with, with what's actually being, being written in the text. Now, the second thing that we have to keep in mind with this term in a historical way is that the term probably predates Buddhist usage. And this is a particularly interesting point because as I began the video, I was saying that Tathagata is sort of a term that nowadays we tend to think of, or some people uh, tend to think of, the word as exclusively sort of coined for the Buddha, that it was a, a term that could only describe the Buddha himself, that it was such a special term, such an important term, so freighted and weighted with different connotations and meanings and so on, that it, you know, it only would refer to him. But in fact, historically, that's not the case, or at least it doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be a term that predates, as I say, predates Buddhism. Uh, one early paper by the scholar E.J. Thomas finds it originating in Jainism in a Prakrit form, Tahagaya, by that, by, by Prakrit form, what I mean is that it's in a dialect, not quite the same as Pali, but the same word with a slightly different pronunciation, we could say. So it would have been Tahagaya in, Jain, in, in, in Jainism, and then, potentially at least, uh, the Buddhists would have adopted it from the Jain usage. As, uh, as Thomas says, that the term started with the literal meaning in Buddhism could only be assumed if the Buddhists invented it. But it is much more likely that, like arahat and such words, it was taken over from the Jains as an already established term. The meaning it would then have would be the dogmatic sense of an epithet already applied to the master. That is to say, the Jains would have used the term as describing their own master, and the, Buddhas, the Buddhists would have taken it over with the same kind of usage, simply uh, referring to a different person, a different master, the Buddha, instead of a Jain master. Uh, now also, uh, in case we're not particularly interested in Jain suttas, there's also uh, evidence within the Buddhist suttas themselves that the term was in general usage at the time that the Buddha was alive. Now there's one particular sutta called the Anuradha Sutta, in which it's said that wanderers who follow other paths 
went up to the monk Anuradha and asked him a bunch of questions. Basically, they were interested in what the Buddhists thought, uh, because they were not Buddhists. They were, as I, as I say, they were from other traditions. Uh, they were interested in what the Buddhists thought, so they went up to this monk and asked him questions. Uh, and Anuradha basically uh, tried to answer the questions. But the way that they put the questions to Anuradha, I think, is interesting. So they say, Friend Anuradha, when a Tathagata is describing a Tathagata, the highest type of person, the supreme person, the attainer of the supreme attainment, he describes him in terms of these four cases. The Tathagata exists after death, or the Tathagata does not exist after death, or the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death, or the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. So they're asking Anuradha general questions about what happens to a supreme being after they die. Now, their idea of what a supreme being was would probably have been somewhat different from the Buddhist's idea of what a supreme being was. They would have had different kinds of abilities, different kinds of practices, but nevertheless, they both had this idea of a supreme being. And so, for them, the word Tathagata referred to just such a being, as they say, uh, the, the highest type of person, the supreme person, the attainer of the supreme attainment. Now, they weren't Buddhists, so they wouldn't have been talking about the Buddha here in particular when they were referring to somebody who has of the supreme attainment. They would have been referring to their own masters. Uh, but nevertheless, what they're, what they're asking is, you know, basically what they're saying is, you know, we have answers to these questions of whether the Tathagata dies or doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, survives death or not. What do you say? Uh, now, many of us will know that in the Buddhist uh, Dharma, there are no answers to those four questions. These are four of the famous unanswered questions. Uh, but that's, but nevertheless, that aside, the, the point here is that they both use the same term for their master, Tathagata. And presumably it would have had a very similar meaning to the one that we have supposed for the word within a Buddhist context. That, that is, it would have meant somebody who has gone from, uh, or gone to the supreme attainment, whatever it is, or potentially it might mean somebody who has come from the supreme attainment, although most scholars think that's less likely. Or perhaps even in Richard Gombrich's sense, the term simply meant one that is like that. In other words, that the, the, the master is somebody who, whose, whose attainments are so great that they are beyond language, that they're beyond the ability of us to describe. In other words, whatever of these meanings we take for, for the term, they could have been available to anybody in the Buddha's day and probably were used quite broadly with similar kinds of meanings. In other words, coming from within a Buddhist context, we tend to think that all of this stuff must have originated with the Buddha or originated in Buddhism with ideas grounded in the Buddhist Dharma, whereas it seems that many of these ideas actually predate the Buddhist Dharma and might have had a very similar meaning at the time, but simply not one that was associated with the Buddha in particular. So we see that even from within the Buddhist suttas themselves, there are indications that these, this term and presumably the ideas that surrounded it are not exclusively Buddhist. Now, if you're interested in these unanswered questions, these questions that uh, the, the wanderers from other sects were asking Anuradha, I have a separate video on that very subject, and I'll leave a link to it up here on the screen if you're not familiar with it. If you're getting something out of these videos of mine, by the way, and would like to help support the channel and the work that uh, we're all doing here, consider taking a look over at my Patreon page, which is linked down below, and seeing if you want to help support and get uh, some fun things in return. Thanks so much to you all, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.